Grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ, the Anointed One of God. And let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the day. It is a day that you have made and we rejoice in it. Lord, we rejoice in your word and we rejoice in the word that became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Lord, we thank you. Today we will conclude our study of Peter's first letter. It has indeed been a blessing to us. Now, Lord, I ask... As always, I ask that you would anoint my tongue to declare your word this morning and anoint every ear that hears it to receive it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, we heard how we should not be surprised if we are called to suffer for Christ. We live in enemy territory. We became enemies of the devil when we came to believe in Jesus as our Savior and Lord. As his enemies, the, de the devil is going to do whatever he can to destroy us. We're not to worry about such things because, as Paul reminds us, if God is for us, who can be against us? And the answer is no one. No one. Though the troubles we may be called to endure could be difficult, they ultimately work for God's glory and for our good. These are the refining fires which refine out of us the stuff that God does not want in us, that doesn't belong in any child of God. What we need to do is learn how to rejoice in our sufferings. They will only last a little while. And even should we be called to die for Christ, we're not going to be dead. We will be alive with him forevermore. We will enjoy eternal love. We will enjoy the presence of our God always. Nothing can be better than this. Today we move to 1 Peter 5. It's the last chapter in Peter's first letter, and it begins by addressing elders. He exhorts them. Now the word exhort means to urge the elders to and encourage them to act in a particular way toward those under their care and keeping. However, before he gets to talking to the elders in this letter, he lets them first know that he too is an elder. He's familiar about the things that he writes. Okay? And so he, he says, concerning himself, I am who am a fellow elder, a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of of the glory that will be revealed. Peter is a fellow elder. Unlike them, he was a witness of Christ's sufferings. But like them, he is going to have a share in the glory that they will enjoy. There isn't going to be an us and a them in glory. There won't be people who get to enjoy some wonderful things in glory and others not. No, everyone who belongs to Jesus Christ will participate in the glory that is going to be revealed. Now to the elders, P Peter says, he says, shepherd the flock of God which is among you serving as overseers. First and foremost, Peter tells them to shepherd the flock of God. These elders were to shepherd the people who belong, who belong to God. They don't belong to the elders. Peter tells the elders that they're to shepherd the flock of God serving as overseers. Now, if we take a look at the responsibilities of those who actually serve as shepherd of actual sheep, you know, we get an idea of how shepherds of people are to act. An idea. It's not perfect, but it's, it's an idea. Shepherds of sheep, they tended to the needs of the flock. They led them to good grazing land. They led them to quiet waters where they could quench their thirst without fear of falling in and being carried off by rapids. They groomed them. They sheared them. Should they become injured or ill, they took care of their needs. They guarded them from predators. More often than not, the shepherd wasn't the owner of the sheep. They were a hired person, one to watch over the sheep of somebody else, who belonged to somebody else. 
though the, she- the sheep did not belong to the shepherds, generally speaking, the shepherds were accountable to the owner for the animals under his care. Should any of the sheep get stolen, the shepherd had to repay the owner for his loss. Should they get lost, the shepherds went out in search of them because they did not want to bear the financial burden. Should any of the sheep die by getting torn by wild beasts, the shepherds, if it was possible, they would bring the remains of the dead animal to the owner so that the owner um, would understand that that particular sheep was killed by wild animals and then the shepherd would not have to reimburse the owner for the loss. You know, being potentially responsible for any losses led the shepherds to take great care of the sheep under their care. Now every person, every elder in Christ's church needs to take a look at this list of responsibility and ponder. Ponder them seriously. It's not a light thing to be given the responsibility of being an elder of a flock. It is difficult work. It is responsible work. It is a position of great trust. Peter specifically calls out to every potential elder that they were to oversee the flock. To oversee a flock does not mean that the elders were supposed to do all the work of the congregation. No, they're to oversee congregational life. They supervise. They divide the workload up because there aren't enough hours in the day for any one person to do all the work of ministry. Also, no one has the energy to do it all. The work of ministry needs uh, to be shared. And yet, there still has to be somebody to to make sure it all gets done. So somebody has to supervise. Next, Peter tells the shepherds. He says, these shepherds of God's flock, they were, they are, to do their work as follows, not by compulsion, but willingly. Willingly. When asking or considering somebody to consider becoming an elder, there should not be any arm-twisting, coercion, begging, or anything remotely close to compulsion involved. The word compulsion means to force or to add pressure to the request for a person to become an elder. Let me go down a very short rabbit trail here. In the arena of any church leadership role, I, and I'm I'm imagining the all too, have seen a great deal of compulsion used over the course of the years of a congregational life in order to get people to serve in a congregation. This ought not be so. Any person who isn't willing to do the work of being an elder or a Sunday school teacher or a council member or what have you isn't going to have the congregation's interests at heart and more likely to not, they won't do a very good job. Does any congregation actually want that? Talk about bringing down the morale of a congregation. That would do it. Peter lets us know that elders are to be willing to serve as elders. The same must be true for all positions which are needed to be filled in Christ's church. The church of Jesus Christ is not a forced labor camp. If workers can't be found, then maybe it's time to reconsider what's essential for congregational life and what isn't and eliminate those things that people don't willingly want to do. Now getting back to what Peter says regarding elders, Elders should not become elders for any kind of dishonest gain, but eagerly. Well, now what kind of dishonest gain could there be associated with being an elder of a congregation? Well, potentially there could be plenty. Just on, not elders, but let's just talk about congregational members in general. Some business owners have been known to join congregations just so that they might network among the congregational members, so that they might gain more business in a particular community. They're not at the congregations to to worship God. They're there to network. That's not the right way, the the, right reason to be there. Reverse the thinking. 
some elders or some people who might serve as elders might want a better deal on something that they might want to purchase or a better interest rate from the bankers or some such thing. This ought not to be so. Elders need to serve willingly and not be out to fleece the flock under their care. Lastly, Peter tells elders that they ought not be lords over those entrusted to them, but being examples of the flock. There is no place, no place within the body of Christ for anyone to lord it over anyone else. Jesus was extremely clear about this, and he was the perfect example. He is the teacher and lord of the disciples, or he the teacher and lord of the disciples, didn't lord it over them. He was the example. Now he said, you know, Gentiles, unbelievers, often lord it over other people, but he said, you're not to do that. Peter closes this exhortation to those who would be elders with these words. He says, and when the chief shepherd appears, you, elders, will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Put another way, the reward that an elder receives is not going to be in this life. The reward of any believer in Jesus Christ is not to be found in this life. It's to be found in the next life. We've got to remember this. Peter then turns his attention to younger people. He doesn't really say a whole lot about, you know, to them. But what he says is important. He says, beginning of verse 5, Likewise, you younger people, Submit yourselves to elders. Now, what does Peter mean when he says this? Consider what it means to submit to someone. The word means to be under obedience or to be obedient to, to be put under, to be subdued under, to make subject to or be in subjection to. Those are all words we love, right? Mm, not so much. You know, we have some young people in the congregation, and every one of us who isn't all that young chronologically, we once were young. And we all know what we were like when we were young. Unless it's just me. But I don't think so. We all had to grow up, and we all probably went through some kind of um, tough years. Let's just call them tough years. When it when being subject to anybody was hard. <laughs> oh, is that what you call it? Growing pains? Okay. <laughs> Rebelliousness was my you know, like, oh. Anyway, the young can be kind of uncooperative and disobedient of adults. But Peter commands, and actually the word is a command. It's in the imperative mood. He commands them to submit yourselves to elders. Now, I've got to ask the question, is Peter referring to the elders overseeing the congregation or older people in general? And I think he could be referring to both, okay? Uh, he could be referring to the elders that he you know, first addressed, but he could be referring to older people in general. You know, those of us who have quite a few years of life behind us have learned a thing or two and gained some, some wisdom because of the experiences of life that we've had. Younger people don't have the years needed to develop wisdom. Developing wisdom takes time. There is no shortcut to it. I, you know, I, was, I was counseling somebody right before their wedding and talking to the, the bride-to-be. And, you know, and I just told her, I said, you know, I was 50 years old before I realized I might have had a little bit of wisdom. A little bit. I wasn't even claiming much. But I was 50. You know, a young person has much to learn by listening to the wisdom of elders. Then Peter goes on to say, beyond the young, he says, yes, all of you, all of you, be submissive to one another. You know, we really do have a lot to learn from each other. We really do. No one person has all of the insight needed at any, you know, for any given situation. We need to listen to and learn from each other. The wisdom we can learn from each other is so very important. So, so what if we must bend our will to what somebody else suggests? 
Peter says, he says it very well, he says, be clothed with humility. Be clothed with humility. Don't always think that we have to be right all the time. I love it when I realize I'm wrong. It's like, thank you, Lord. That's a good thing. But be clothed with humility. He says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you. You know, the best example that we have of somebody who humbled themselves under the mighty hand of God is Jesus. He, the Son of God, existing with the Father from all eternity, humbled himself and became a human being. And then he further humbled himself by submitting to being arrested, tried, tortured, and killed for nothing that he had done. He did it all for us. But look what happened to him. After going through all that he did, God raised him up from the dead and exalted him and seated him at God's right hand. Notice what Peter writes. He writes that if we humble ourselves, God may exalt us. But the words Peter uses is, in due time. In other words, should God choose to exalt us, he will exalt us in his time, not our time. We can't hurry up the plans and purposes of God. He is in control, not us. We are also to cast all of our cares upon God, for he cares for us. Does God really care for us? Absolutely he does. He, he does far more than we can imagine. He also knows our needs more than we do. He's able to care for us in ways that we cannot imagine. So let's cast all of our cares on him, for he cares so very much for us. Now we began today's message by being reminded that we live in enemy territory because we've been transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into God's kingdom and light. And, you know, that's where we are now because of faith in Jesus Christ. But because we live in enemy territory, Peter continues his exhortation in verses 8 and 9. And he says, be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because our adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Our adversary, the devil, is out to devour everyone who belongs to Christ. You know, this is really a good general admonition. Okay? But let me give you one that's a little more specific from my own personal experience. We are the most vulnerable to the attack of the devil, to being devoured by the devil, after a spiritual victory. We are most vulnerable to attack after a spiritual victory. The reason why we are most vulnerable then is because after a spiritual victory, we tend to let our guard down. We go, whew, we got through that. Well, excuse me, you just let the guard down and the, dog, and the door wide open. Well, the devil can come on in. Being sober, being vigilant is a constant for us because we continually live in enemy territory. Now, you know, I without a doubt, I can guarantee, oh, I've already said this, but I'll say it again. I can guarantee everyone here, or everyone who's going to be listening to this on the Internet, that the devil is looking for the moment we let our guard down. We don't live in a vacuum, people. We live in a spiritually infused world. And though we cannot see, you know, beyond this particular veil, the enemy is always looking for our guard to come down so that he might attack us in some way. This is really another reason for the older folks to be mentoring younger folks and for the younger folks to listen to those with wisdom. We just might be spared a whole lot of heartache if we take the advice others give us in the household of faith. P 
Peter says we're to resist the adversary, steadfast in faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. I always take great comfort in that, knowing that I'm not the only one. You know, thank you, Lord, I'm not the only one. I appreciate it. You know, Peter wouldn't have said resist the devil. He wouldn't have said that if it wasn't possible, if it wasn't possible for us to resist the devil, okay? He wouldn't have said that if it wasn't possible. Now, can we resist the devil in our own strength? No. We can only resist the devil to the extent that we remain close to God. We can't let there be so much as a crack between us and God that the devil might ex exploit. We've got to remember this. Another thing to remember is this. Everyone who belongs to Christ throughout the world experiences some kind of suffering. Some kind. And everybody doesn't experience the same kind of suffering. God deals with everybody individually. But some kind of suffering is going to come, you know, Again, we can draw comfort from this for the fact that we know that we're not alone in this. Now, in contrast to the troubles the adversary is likely going to throw at us, Peter closes his thoughts by saying, but may the God of all grace, who calls us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after, 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 after you have suffered, suffered a while, perfect, establish, Strengthen and settle you. Let's take a little time to hear what Peter says. He tells his readers, after you have suffered, as long as God appoints for you to suffer, God will make you perfect. Now perfect here does not mean sinless. It means restored, mended, or fit together rightly. You know, we may very well come out of a season of trials and troubles and suffering very well bruised and beaten up, okay? He's going to supply whatever we need to fit us together rightly, the way God wants us to be fit together rightly. We're never going to be the same again. You can't go back. You can only go forward, all right? He will also establish us. The Greek word means to set fast, to fix firmly, to render immovable. When it comes to living in a world that's hostile to us and to the Savior that we love, it's a very good thing for God to take the sufferings we go through and use them to fix us in such a way that we won't be easily moved from our allegiance to Christ Jesus. Our wonderful God, by his amazing grace, will also give us the strength to bear everything that we will be called upon to endure. He doesn't just leave us out there doing it by ourselves. He's going to give us the strength to go through these things. And he will also settle us. And that means he's going to found us or establish us on our firm foundation. The picture here is of a house so firmly fixed on the foundation that it will not be moved by wind or flood. Then Peter begins to close his first letter by praising the God who by his grace is able to perfect, establish, strengthen and settle us. He proclaims to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Absolutely, to this, this wonderful God of ours and to him alone be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Peter closes his letter by letting his readers know that Sylvanus helped him prepare the letter and then he adds some greetings. He says, by Sylvanus, meaning by the help of Sylvanus, a faithful brother as I consider him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the grace of God in which you stand. She who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you. And so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a kiss of love. And then Peter adds, peace to you all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Yes, peace to you all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen.